James Kaplan, welcome to the show. Delighted to be here, Brett. Thanks so much for having me. So uh, your second biography, or biography of Frank Sinatra, came out last year. And this biography picks up, it's called The Chairman, the subtitle. And it picks up right after Frank Sinatra won the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor for uh, From Here to Eternity. Um, but you talk about in the book that before uh, this, this, he won this award, Sinatra's career was pretty much in the tank. And I'm curious, can you give us a little backstory? Like, how did Frank Sinatra going from making thousands of Bobby Socks or, you know, soccer's faint during World War II to, you know, people couldn't even recognize him on the streets in New York City? Yeah, well, the uh, the book that just came out was the second volume of my biography of Sinatra, second and final. First volume was called Frank the Voice and covered his rise uh, to incredible superstardom, mainly during World War II. World War II was really what uh, what jet propelled Frank Sinatra's career uh, to its apex during those years because. In those in that time, he was singing these uh, ballads of yearning that so rhymed with the way the country was feeling, uh, feelings of uh, gentle sadness and, and missing the boys who were away uh, fighting overseas. Of course, Frank was not away fi- fighting overseas. He had been classified 4F. A lot of people suspected that and th- called him a draft dodger. But his records and, and and William Manchester, who wrote a, a great history of uh, the armed forces in, in South Pacific in World War II, where he also served very bravely as a Marine, uh, said that Sinatra was the most despised man in the armed forces <laughs> uh, because the, all the all the guys fighting overseas felt that the Sinatra, the draft dodger, was back at home uh, fooling around with their women. And in many cases, they were right. Uh, he wasn't a draft dodger. He really did have a punctured ear drum, but the perception lingered. Despite the perception, though, he sold a ton of records in World War II. After the war, very, very quickly, things changed in America. The political climate became very conservative, uh, and the popular culture in America of America really became extremely conservative after World War II, and tastes in popular music uh, shifted gears just like that overnight. Suddenly, people were no longer interested in uh, in the ballads of yearning. Suddenly, the big band era, which had begun 10 years previously in about 1935, uh, began fading away very quickly. And America was in this odd state of jubilation and fear. Jubilation because the war was over and fear because of the rise of the Soviet Union. That accounts for the political conservatism and also, I think, the popular culture, too. So uh, popular music, music really uh, got pretty terrible in the wake of World War II very quickly. There are a lot, all kinds of novelty songs. People wanted escape after World War II. So they were listening to stuff like How Much Is That Doggy in the Window. Uh, they And Sinatra, who was still recording for Columbia at that point, <clears throat> uh, but unlike many other, uh, unlike every other popular singer, had enough power to dictate what he could record. Still, he decided to go along with the tide. He re- he tried to, to, he did record a number of these uh, crummy, uh, crummy novelty numbers, Tennessee Newsboy, uh, most infamously, this the worst record he ever made, Mama Will Bark. His his career after World War II uh, went down the tubes for a few reasons. It wasn't just that tastes in popular music had changed. Uh, it was really a multi-determined problem, and a lot of the problems Frank created for himself. Uh, he was, in 1947, early 1947, he went to Havana, Cuba, to attend a Mafia Summit conference. Officially, he went because he was there to entertain all these top uh, mobsters. Uh, It's also been alleged over the years that he brought a suitcase containing packed uh, with cash for Lucky Luciano uh, as tribute. And he was cited in Havana by a columnist for the Hearst Papers. uh, And this columnist began to write uh, disparaging columns about Sinatra's affection for the mob. The Hearst papers were very politically conservative, again, chiming with the times. Frank uh, 
Frank was a dyed-in-the-wool liberal Democrat. He was an FDR Democrat. The Hearst papers hated him for that, and suddenly they had something to call him out for. Well, that wasn't enough for Frank. He also, uh, from the day he set foot in Hollywood, he began stepping out on his uh, on his young wife, Nancy, uh, with all kinds of Holly, Hollywood uh, starlets. And... Uh, In 1948-49, he stepped that up. He was cited with Lana Lana Turner, uh, and then he began this famous affair with Ava Gardner. And uh, in 1951, his his wife changed the locks on the house and divorced him. But that wasn't all. His record label Columbia dropped him because he wasn't selling records. His movie studio, MGM, dropped him uh, for various reasons, but they had gotten tired of him at that point. His agents dropped him. He wasn't selling records. He wasn't really making movies. He married Ava in 1951, but his his career was sinking just as fast as her career was, was rising. And... and uh, as crazy as they were for each other, Frank and Ava, she began to get sick of his moping around, and uh, so his marriage wasn't even working well then. It was, it was a perfect storm of events, and again, Frank himself had a lot to do with almost all of them. So, did he? So he's at the bottom of his career, lowest of the lows. From what you've read and researched about him, did he purposely like think, okay, I got to do something about this. I got to do something to kickstart my career. I mean, did he deliberately start thinking about how he could catapult himself back into... Constantly. Constantly. Frank Sinatra was the most important thing to Frank Sinatra throughout his entire his entire working life from the time he first uh, started singing professionally in his uh, in his very early 20s uh, then went on the road with Harry James and then Tommy Dorsey then went out on his own as a singer uh, through his decline into his comeback and until the very end of his singing career the last concert he ever sang was in February 1995 after an incredible uh, 60 year career Every minute of every day, Frank Sinatra was thinking about his singing and about his career. That was his priority. And so you can bet that during those years of decline, he was obsessing every waking minute about how he could come back. Easier said than done, though. Easier thought about than done. He was incredibly frustrated, incredibly depressed. Uh, this is a period when uh, he made uh, he made uh, a couple of the first of his uh, his three suicide attempts. He was as low as you could get. And yes, as you said before, this is a point when he could walk through Times Square in New York, where in 1944 he had created a mob scene around the Paramount Theater with those with those fabled Bobby Soxers. Uh, he could walk unnoticed, unrecognized. Sammy Davis Jr. happened to be in Times Square and saw Frank walking through with his collar up and nobody recognized him. Wow. So, okay, you said that after World War II, the music uh, tastes changed um, during the 1950s. But during the 50s, this is where a lot of the albums that we listen to today, you know, came out and a lot of the songs that he, he, he recorded. So, and it was kind of a weird time because like you said, the big band era was over, but yet rock and roll was just starting. So what did Frank Sinatra tap into that, into the, like the American taste in music that people were like, yeah, this is great. We like what he's doing. How was it different from the big band stuff? And, uh, but how was it also different from like rock and roll? Well, Sinatra did more than tap into. Uh, Sinatra really created a revolution in popular music. Rock and roll, of course, was its own revolution in uh, in 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 popular music. Rocket '88, that uh, that historic uh, cut, was recorded in 1951, and rock and roll was on its way, headed headed straight up. Elvis Elvis would be walking down the street in just a couple of years after Rocket '88 and meeting Sam Phillips uh, uh, historically in in. Uh, at Sun Records in in uh, in Memphis, but but Sinatra created his own 
revolution in popular music. It wasn't it wasn't so much a tapping into. Let's let's step back a couple of years and remember that between the end of World War II and and around 1952 or 1953 People were just buying a lot of junk. It was all this very transitory, transient, ephemeral music that just kind of feel good. Uh, Doggy in the window and and, uh, and Mitch Miller over at Columbia had uh, had Sinatra uh, recording these these crummy novelty numbers, and he had uh, other great artists like Rosemary Clooney was recording recording uh, Mambo Italiano and Come On to My House. It was all very. Uh, uh, it was all kind of honky tonk, herky jerky, silly music. Sinatra was dropped by Columbia Records. They they failed to renew his contract in 1951, and he drifted without a label for a couple of years. In 1953, and the the importance of this cannot be overestimated. An incredibly uh, far sighted young executive at Capitol Records out in Hollywood, uh, a young guy named Alan Livingston decided to sign Sinatra. Uh, he signed Sinatra because he knew that Sinatra, he knew how talented, incredibly talented Sinatra was, and he had some ideas, Alan Livingston did. He signed Sinatra to a standard artist, beginning artist contract uh, for, uh, for a sum in the three figures, low three figures. I mean, we're talking a couple of hundred dollars. And when Alan Livingston told his Capitol record sales force that he had just signed Sinatra, Frank Sinatra, a room full of a couple hundred uh, salesmen for Capitol Records, they all groaned. This guy was such a drug on the market at that point. But Livingston's idea was he wanted to team this incredibly talented singer whose talent Livingston recognized despite how down on his luck Frank was. He wanted to team Sinatra with a young, totally unknown uh, arranger, a guy named Nelson Riddle, uh, who I'm sure many of your listeners have heard of. But then nobody knew who he was. Frank Sinatra didn't know who he was. And uh, he teamed up Sinatra with Nelson Riddle, and uh, they recorded a number uh, very early in their collaboration together called uh, I Got the World on a String. And when Sinatra heard the playback of uh, of that number that he just recorded with Riddle's incredible arrangement, because this guy could arrange like nobody else, Sinatra said, I'm back, baby. I'm back. He knew it. He knew it, and he knew he had it with Nelson Riddle. And he and Riddle began to turn out these singles and these albums that uh, that created, uh, as I said, a revolution in popular music. And let me just say one more thing about that revolution, because this is very important to understand. We talk today about the great standards, uh, Cole Porter, Irving Berlin, the Gershwins, all these, uh, the great American songbook, all these amazing numbers that stand the test of time, uh, so beautifully constructed that they, that, uh, that, that modern, uh, mo- modern artists keep Recording them over, Lady Gaga, Buble, you know, and people will, will continue to record them for <clears throat> for decades and centuries to come because they are great and they're classics. Sinatra was the one who really created the idea of the standard. These songs were not being recorded before Sinatra insisted at the end of his Columbia Records career and at the beginning of his Capitol Records career in 1953, Sinatra insisted on recording them. When he performed them in concert, he would always credit the great songwriters. So uh, it's a long-winded answer, Brett, to your question. But what I do want to say that it wasn't something that – it wasn't Sinatra feeling the pulse of America. Sinatra was creating the pulse of America. This was a great transformative artist who had uh, – who had ears, who had a, a musical understanding on a Mozartian level and knew what he wanted to do with popular music and and uh, created a revolution. Yeah, that kind of leads to my next question, because uh, I thought it was interesting. I love, what I love about your book, James, is that you you take us into the, these recording sessions and uh, talk about the the dynamic between Sinatra and the uh, the arranger and the, 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 uh, or- the orchestra. And I think it's interesting, because I think maybe a lot of people today... Um, 
think of Sinatra as like pop stars of today that, you know, he had a nice voice and he just goes in and sings the songs that the music, the musicians wrote and that's it. But you, the way you describe the the recording sessions, you're like Sinatra was like almost a conductor uh, almost. And he was making these little improvisations and he could just tell right away that we need to like, you know, the violins need to do this. So, I mean, was he different from some of the other popular crooners in the, uh, during the time because of his musical ability? Yes, he was absolutely different. Uh, he, this was a musical genius. Uh, this was a guy who knew exactly how he wanted those recordings to sound. We talk about record producers. Uh, the great George Martin just died a couple of uh, days ago, and a great, great producer. And uh, producers today, uh, people like Nile Rodgers and Pharrell Williams, these are people who go into a studio and shape every every bar of every song, every second of every every track that that uh, that's recorded. Sinatra had people who were called producers, but Sinatra really produced all his own albums and all his own singles. He was the guy who knew exactly how he wanted these records to sound. He was the guy who had such incredible ears that if the third violin in his orchestra, and Sinatra, by the way, was a guy who revered musicians. He he never wanted to be in an isolation booth singing uh, when he was recording. He always wanted to be out there with the musicians. If the third violinist was a half note off, he would look, he would stop the music and freeze the guy with uh, uh, with a glare from those electric blue eyes and say, where are you working next week? Sinatra knew exactly how he wanted these uh, these songs to sound. And despite the fact that this is a guy who who really couldn't read music, he, 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 he couldn't read, he still knew his way around a score. And so he could say, uh, uh, bar 45, uh, shouldn't that be maybe an F natural instead of an F sharp? He knew stuff like that. And we also have to remember that these songs he was recording, unlike the songs of today, all came from written arrangements. These were uh, these were charts. These were very detailed uh, uh, arrangements that were written by great arrangers, such as Riddle and Billy May and uh, and. Uh, Sinatra worked with dozens of terrific arrangers, up to Quincy Jones and Klaus Ogerman and Don Costa and uh, uh, Gordon Jenkins. These were all brilliant men uh, with whom Sinatra purposely allied, allied himself. He, he hired these guys because he knew what they could do for him, but Sinatra was the boss. Right. So, yeah, I mean, I, I love Sinatra's music. I mean, I listened to uh, Sirius Sinatra on a serious F, you know, XM radio all, all the time. Um, but the thing that I've always been conflicted about the guy, because he's a, an extremely complex character, uh, super talented. I love his music, but then you do such a great job in the book painting this, the complexities of Sinatra. I mean, like the man had a lot of paradoxes about him. And as you said earlier, some of these uh, sort of the, the darker side of Sinatra uh, caused him problems with not only his, family life, his love life, but also his career. So can you talk about some of these personality paradoxes and, and how that affected friendships, uh, business associates, and even uh, his his lovers and his wife and ex-wives? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, this was, well, there, there are a few things you have to talk about when you're talking about Sinatra's personality. He was, as you say, this was a musical genius, uh, but he was also a guy who could, uh, who also, uh, also had a genius for making himself dislikable. And I spent ten years writing these two books about Sinatra, and there were a lot of times when I disliked him when I was writing about him, but I never got bored with him. Uh, he wasn't, he was never boring. Uh, there are a few things you need to talk about when you talk about the demons that were inside Sinatra. One, uh, one big one was his mother. Uh, his mother was named Dolly Sinatra. She was a volcano. She was under five feet tall, little tiny woman who was brilliant, uh, swore like a sailor. Uh, uh, she was a Democratic Party organizer in, uh, in Hoboken, New Jersey, where Frank grew up. She spoke every dialect of Italian when she went around Hoboken getting out the vote for Franklin Delano Roosevelt. 
she was she was volcanically she had a volcanic temper she had she was uh, pathologically impatient and Sinatra in many ways was the same person as his mother but this was a mother who uh, Sinatra later said he never knew whether she was going to hug him or hit him and that was literally true she he was never certain of his mother's uh, love for him and that really conditioned his relationships for the rest of his life, especially with women. His, da- his younger daughter, Tina Sinatra, wrote a wonderful memoir and, and wrote in her book, My Father Was a Deeply Feeling Man Who Was Unable to Attain an Intimate Relationship with Another Human Being. And that included all the many hundreds, if not thousands, of love affairs he had. Uh, he, he, he loved women in a lot of ways, but he never really loved. It was very very, very difficult, if not impossible, for him to be intimate with somebody else. Okay, so then you have to add all that, all that that I just said to the fact that this was a kid who uh, who was a musical genius. He said in later life that when he was walking around as a kid, he heard the music of the spheres. Well, that sounds very high-flown and exaggerated, but I think it was literally true. This is a guy who heard sounds in his head that other people didn't hear. And so there he is walking around Hoboken, New Jersey in the 1920s and the 1930s, a very tough town where if an Italian kid walked across uh, the wrong street into the Irish neighborhood, he could get the crap beaten out of him. Uh, And uh, this was a kid who was a genius. That was not easy to walk around with. Uh, So he kind of had to keep that hidden. All his, he was a highly, highly strung guy, very oversensitive. He had to keep that hidden. He, he wanted to, he, he always wanted to seem tough. That was, that was important in Hoboken when he was a kid. It was important when he had grown up and the toughest guys of all, when he was growing up in Hoboken, the twenties and thirties as an Italian American kid, when Italian Americans, uh, one of the things I learned writing writing these books, uh, it, it's it's easy sometimes to sort of feel this reflexive nostalgia for the way America used to be. Oh, things were better in the old days when men were men and women were women. And, you know, some of that's true. Uh, there was a lot that was very bad in this country in the old days. And the, the very worst thing that I found was this very easy, reflexive uh, racism that existed in this country. Uh, there's still a lot of it around, but there was, uh, it wasn't even questioned in those days. If you were a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant male, uh, you could, and you had some money, you could, uh, you could be in the ruling class. If you didn't, you were out of luck. And Italian Americans were just a half a step above, uh, uh, African Americans on the social scale and Italian Americans like African Americans were looked on as happy singing dancing people uh and 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 also uh who who now and then uh, murdered people right they were they were either clowns or they were mobsters and that was that was rough for Frank to live with but he as soon as he began performing in clubs he began running into these guys who ran the nightclubs in those days and they were the mafia the mafia ran the nightclubs and and a lot of them were italian america uh, italian american the mobsters uh, and and frank uh, idolized these guys they were men of power they were men of strength and he saw them incorrectly but he felt they were men of honor too so uh, so this is a guy who is full of demons, and this is a guy who is highly strung and oversensitive and a musical genius and whose mother didn't really love him. And boo-hoo, that sounds sad, but if it happens to you, it's real, and it happened to him. He couldn't really form an intimate relationship. He was too highly strung, and once Ava threw him over, Ava Gardner threw him over in the early 50s, he began to drink pretty seriously. Alcohol became a big part of his life, and he was a mean drunk. He was an angry drunk, and he had all these demons inside, and when he drank, the demons would come out. So there is a there's an answer to your question. There are an awful lot of things inside Sinatra that were bugging him, and uh, and they could make him behave very badly. Right. I mean, going back to uh, the volatility. I mean, you had these you describe encounters where you know he would go after men who were like twice his size. There was an encounter where he went after uh, John Wayne. Yeah, in the parking unbelievable. Lot. Frank Sinatra was five foot seven, five foot seven in the stocking feet, and until he put on some weight, uh, 
in his 50s, he was a guy who weighed maybe in the 120s, 130s. He's a little man with thin wrists and, and delicate hands. But he had this volcanic temper, same as his mother did. He was pretty fearless. And when he was in his cups, when he had a couple of drinks in him and he was feeling angry about something, yeah, I mean, he went right up against John Wayne. Uh, and <laughs> you're talking about a guy who was six foot four and who was a genuine tough guy. Uh, Frank, Frank wasn't afraid uh, for a second standing in front of John Wayne. And John, John Wayne uh, didn't want to fight Frank Sinatra. It wasn't that he was scared. He just didn't want to fight him, uh, to his credit. Right, yeah. And I thought it was funny. I mean, <laughs> the circumstances of the fight was, there's a dose of irony to it because uh, it was like at a party in yep. uh, Vegas. A and, benefit. And, and Sinatra was dressed like a Indian squaw. Yes, he was. It's in the old uh, politically incorrect right. terminology. Yes, yeah, we're not and, allowed to say that anymore. But right, that's exactly. How he was that, that's how he was dressed. That's how that's as, how he was saying. An Indian dressed. woman, a uh, Native American woman, and <laughs> and there's Wayne, the Duke, with his. Uh, he's six foot four in his stocking feet, and he's got on the cowboy hat, which makes <laughs> him about six foot nine. <laughs> right. <laughs> and there they are facing off in a parking lot. Yeah. So yeah, this. These, this this personality of Sinatra. So he had the mother, the issues with his mother and this volatile. And it seems like, yeah, he had a chip on his shoulder uh, oh, yeah. being an Italian-American. And he was talented and he knew it. Um, and so it, it kind of the theme that you extra, that you you see throughout the book, and I think all these these three things come together with it, is that Sinatra was very interested in power. Uh not only in, in business, but it also carried over. He wanted to get into the political arena. We'll we can talk a little bit more on his relationship with uh, JFK. But what did he do? I mean, why was he obs so obsessed with power? And what did he, I mean, did he have like some common tactics or power pulleys that he would use on people to get what he wanted? Well, power was always important to him from the beginning. Again, this is a guy who, as a kid, had felt himself to be weak, had felt himself to be won down as a small person, as an Italian-American, as, a, as a, a guy who knew he had the goods to become the best popular singer of all time. Uh, but at first, nobody knew it but him. Uh, this is a guy who had to uh, learn to throw his weight around. Power was very important to him. Commercial power, uh, the power of his career. Uh, when he first, uh, when he first broke through, after he went out on his own as a popular singer and became a superstar, and then went out to Hollywood and and signed with uh, signed with MGM, uh, and 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 quickly became one of the hottest stars around uh, Hollywood uh, in in the forties. He knew he had power, and uh, that power meant an enormous amount to him. When his career declined after World War II for that uh, that terrible period between about 1946 and uh, and 1953, when when he signed with Capitol Records and began uh, shooting From Here to Eternity, uh, the movie that would win him the Oscar, and that Oscar would begin his comeback. During that terrible period, that that seven years of bad luck, when he said it felt like all every day was Monday, uh, he knew he felt acutely what it was like not to have power, to lose power, to be powerless, to have had it. I mean, it, it's one thing uh, to have never had power and to and to yearn for it, but uh, imagine having the kind of power he had, then completely losing it and being uh, looked on by everybody as, as a loser, a failure, a has-been. Uh, so it was very important for him to get it back when he began to get it back, when he, when he began making those sublime albums with Nelson Riddle, when he began shooting that great movie From Here to Eternity, and then suddenly, suddenly he went from zero to 60. <laughs> And suddenly the offers were all pouring in again and uh, movie offers, singing offers, TV offers, everything. Very, very quickly uh, as the offers poured in, the money came in and the power began to increase. And uh, he he held on to everything he could grasp and uh, he relished the acquisition of power. The paradox of it, Brett, is that uh, the more power he got – 
uh, and it's it's really kind of like the legend of Midas, who the kid, the, the fabled king, everything he touched turned to gold, mm-hmm. but then he had nothing to eat. He had nobody to love because it was all just gold. Sinatra was very much like that. He acquired all this enormous power, financial power, power in popular music, power as a as as one of the top movie stars around. Uh, and and yet he he couldn't really get close to anybody else. It was a source of of terrible sadness to him, and it was a it was a sadness that he tried to drink away, that he tried to party away, that he tried to. Uh, um, that he tried to sing away, uh, but it was it was a sadness that he re- really couldn't banish. The power was enormous, and it was very important to him. And he uh, and as I said, he loved it, but he he couldn't figure out how to hold on to the power and uh, and be and be truly happy at the same time. And was that desire for power? I mean, is that one of the things that drew him to the the mob? Yes. It was one of the, it was one of, certainly one of the things that drew him to the mob. He saw these guys as powerful guys, and uh, he saw them really as uh, as America's kind of uh, kind of a, uh, a a shadow power in America. You had the government, you had the corporations, and the mob had an awful lot to do with running America in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. They're still around today, but in a more complicated way, and they're more different kinds of mobs. But back then, it was the Italian mob, and to a less, somewhat lesser extent, the Jewish mob. And they ran the nightclubs, they ran the record business, they ran a lot of businesses. And Sinatra, uh, as I said before, idolized them um, and uh, and loved to hang out with them. And in some corner of his soul, kind of would have loved to have been one of them. Uh, he wasn't. He was who he was. It was the same uh, attraction to power that that uh, that drew him to Jack Kennedy the first time he ran into him in in 1955. And okay, so we we the the power was what drew Sinatra to Kennedy, but the feelings were sort of not completely mutual. We'll talk about how Sinatra was really obsessed with Kennedy, and Kennedy was a little more aloof. But what did Kennedy? Why was Kennedy attracted to Frank Sinatra? Well, um, I, 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 how are we rated here? I'll try. I'll try to be discreet. <laughs> uh, I'll try to be. I'll, I'll try to stay PG. Uh, Jack Kennedy, from uh, from an early age, Jack Kennedy was uh, was a, a brilliantly gifted man in his own right. But he was also he was a prince. His father, Joe Kennedy, had uh, had become a. Uh, a mogul in Hollywood in the 1920s, bought into RKO Studios. And as a young prince, even before he went off to World War II, Jack Kennedy began going out to Hollywood. And what he loved about Hollywood was women. Hollywood was uh, was the center of the universe, the world capital of freakishly beautiful women. And John Kennedy, from an early age, wanted to score with every last one of them, much as Frank Sinatra did. When they met in the mid '50s, uh, Jack Kennedy was a politician on his way up. He was also married. He had been married for a couple of years to uh, Jacqueline Bouvier, and uh, uh, he was delighted to be married, and in many ways took delight in his wife. But he uh, had a complete uh, Kennedy had a complete double standard, uh, and and uh, and still saw fit to try to bed every beautiful woman he can. He saw Sinatra as uh, as a magnet for beautiful women. And beautiful women were always around Sinatra because Sinatra had this power in Hollywood and power in popular music in the nightclubs and, and in Las Vegas. And uh, Kennedy found it intensely glamorous and intensely, uh, I- intensely attractive. And... Uh, and uh, and and so this was his pull to Sinatra. Sinatra had his own uh, rather different reasons for being pulled toward Jack Kennedy. Yeah, and it was the way you describe it. Uh, yeah, I, I, like you, like I was reading the book. There's moments in the book where I was like, "Man, this is this is gross. Um, it's kind of repulsive." Uh, I thought it was interesting because we in America today we kind of venerate Kennedy, sort of this, you know, the whole Camelot thing. But I thought it was interesting that. Whenever Kennedy came out to Hollywood, he'd want to talk about 
he'd always shift the direction to Hollywood gossip. Like, yes. he, he read the, 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 the gossip rags and who was sleeping. Like, he wanted to know who's sleeping with who, and yeah. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, well, it's very hard to find any, any uh, uh, really any figure of, of great stature who is an unmixed blessing. You read about Lyndon Johnson, you read about Franklin Roosevelt, uh, these, uh, even Dwight Eisenhower, uh, right? Uh, Dwight Eisenhower, the king of the boring fifties, uh, you know, he had a, he famously had a mistress during world war two Kay Summersby. He has, it's very hard to find figures of great power who, uh, who are just uh, purely good. And Jack Kennedy was a complicated guy. There is something I think to venerate, uh, about Jack Kennedy, sure. although his legacy was very uh, tragically incomplete. This was a guy who was a great leader and who was brilliantly articulate and witty and uh, uh, in, in, in many ways was uh, – was, uh, could have been a wonderful president. Uh, but he was also a deeply flawed man and sex had a great deal to do with it. Right. And it was the um, – that's kind of where the, the mob, like the women in – the connection of, of women and Sinatra and Kennedy, and that kind of where that's where the intersection of the mob came in. That's where Kennedy kind of got in trouble a little bit. Because uh, there's one woman in particular that was also seen one of the top ranking mobsters at the time. And I guess J. Edgar Hoover was really after the Kennedys and had all this evidence. And that was that the, I guess that was the cause of the split between Sinatra and Kennedy, correct? Yeah, although this the split really the 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 fissure began earlier than that. It even began in the campaign year of 1960 when Kennedy was campaigning against Nixon for the presidency. Kennedy's family had a lot of misgivings about uh, Frank Sinatra and about the, their candidate and their their golden knight J JFK associating with Frank Sinatra. Uh, Kennedy family didn't like Frank Sinatra's associations. They didn't. They they knew about uh, his criminal associations, but even uh, even more pressingly for the Kennedy family, Frank Sinatra was a guy who was uh, he wasn't he wasn't high class. He was he he hung around. He was. He was the king of Vegas. He wasn't a guy that they wanted their candidate associated with. But uh, but Jack Kennedy kept associating with him. Uh, he 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 clung to Sinatra uh, because he had uh, JFK really had this kind of precocious. Uh, understanding of how important show business could be uh, in politics, of how uh, how show business figures could help political figures uh, gain the power that they wanted. It was very uh, smart of him, but his family uh, his family rebelled against it. And then uh, once he once he got into office, uh, a couple of things happened that uh, that that were very uh, very bad and very troubling. And yes, they centered around one young woman named Judy Campbell, a girlfriend of Sinatra's, whom he introduced to uh, to Jack Kennedy in Las Vegas in 1960, and then very soon afterwards uh, introduced to his friend, the Chicago mobster, the head of the Chicago mob, Sam John Cana. And in short order, Jack Kennedy was in office as uh, as the head, uh, the leader of the free world, the president of the United States, and sleeping uh, with a woman who was also sleeping with the head of the Chicago mob. And uh, J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI, found out uh, about this and told the attorney general, Robert Kennedy, Jack's brother, about it. And uh, Jack Kennedy, who had been on his way out to uh, uh, for some fun and sun at Frank's place, Frank Sinatra's place in in uh, uh, in Palm Springs, uh, very quickly changed his plans when his brother, the Attorney General, told him, "You can't. You may not stay at Frank Sinatra's house. You have to. <laughs> you have to cut the cord. No more hanging out with this guy." Yeah. Um, and how did that affect Sinatra's political life afterwards? Was he still um, heavily involved? Well, in the he Democratic became Party? he it, it was it was a horrible humiliation for him that that uh, the president who had been going to stay at his Palm Springs house stayed instead at Bing Crosby's house in Palm Springs. Uh, humiliation was always a hair trigger, was always a 
point of volatility for Sinatra. It really, it really set him off any hint of being humiliated. This was a huge public humiliation. And Sinatra, uh, never, oddly enough, never blamed Jack Kennedy for it. He blamed Bobby Kennedy for it. Uh, but that was really the beginning of the end of his relationship with the Kennedys. And it was the very beginning of the end of, uh, of Frank Sinatra's uh, life as a liberal Democrat. He stayed a Democrat uh, through most of the 60s, but by 1968, uh, when Jack Kennedy was gone, uh, uh, he, uh, Sinatra began to began to campaign for Hubert Humphrey, who was running against Nixon that year, but uh, Humphrey's people very quickly found out about Frank's unfortunate friendships with uh, with certain with certain parties and organized crime, and Humphrey dropped him uh, much as Jack Kennedy had dropped him. And and 1970, Ronald Reagan was running for governor of California, and to the horror of Frank Sinatra's Democratic uh, friends, his liberal pals, uh, Sinatra supported Ronald Reagan, and that was the beginning of uh, Frank Sinatra. Uh, Republican instead of Democrat. Interesting. Um, so we can't talk about uh, this part of Frank Sinatra's life without talking about the Rat Pack because I think if you lived in a, if you're a man if you're a boy in college you probably had that famous Sands poster of the Rat Pack in front of the the, the famous Sands sign. Yeah. Um, it's become a it's just, it's a legend. But I thought it was you kind of talk about the create you talk about the creation of the Rat Pack that it was almost accidental. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how that formed and like uh, what went on in the shows and why did people respond, resonate so much with these uh, these impromptu shows that happened in the Sands Hotel? It was impromptu uh, and it was kind of accidental. Uh, Sinatra, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr., Peter Lawford, Joey Bishop were shooting a movie called Ocean's Eleven, uh, which became the seminal primary Rat Pack movie. They were shooting that movie in Vegas in early 1960. That was also a time when Jack Kennedy loved to, he, he stopped through Vegas a couple of times during that period, January, February of 1960, because it was just so much fun. All the guys I mentioned, well, the three primary guys, uh, Frank and Dean and Sammy, were all uh, booked to open at the Sands uh, Hotel Casino in Las Vegas sequentially in, in that month of January 1960. But what happened instead, because they were having uh, such a blast uh, shooting this movie that uh, really was not a very good movie. In fact, it's kind of a terrible movie, but, but, but hugely influential. And, and it's uh, kind of like a car wreck, that movie. It's, you can't quite take your eyes off of it. It's so influential, not a good movie, but they were, and probably not a good movie because of all the fun they were having shooting it. Sinatra was the first one booked at the Sands in January 60. And one night Dean Martin started heckling him. Uh, from off stage, Frank, who took his act very seriously, his singing very seriously, Dean Martin always thought too seriously, uh, first was kind of, kind of taken aback, but then he laughed. And from that laugh, uh, Dean Martin jumped up on stage and, and the Rat Pack was born. Soon they, soon they were all interrupting each other's acts and soon they were all performing together on stage. And this was at a point Vegas, 1960, it's very hard to imagine. You have to imagine your way back into a different time, a different place, a different state of mind. This was a time when, uh, when uh, this was a time when a woman couldn't have a credit card, when women were meant to be wives and mothers and nothing else. And this was a time when uh, smoking and drinking and saying naughty words on stage was seen as as very fun and and Vegas was the capital of naughtiness and these guys created in their breaking each other's acts up and going on stage and making all these uh, making all these drunk jokes and these racial jokes about Sammy Davis Jr. They were the naughtiest thing going and uh, the crowds in Vegas loved it and the Rat Pack became a legend. Uh, you look at it today, people feel different ways about it. I happen to think uh, 
I happen to think from my perspective many years later that it was that that almost everything they did on stage uh, doesn't hold up very well. Unlike Sinatra singing, uh, it doesn't hold up. It, it's just not you had to be there. Right. You had to be there at that time when everything naughty was fun. Well, everything naughty that was naughty then, uh, it's it's not naughty anymore. And so the the humor isn't funny. The racial humor is uh, is kind of offensive. And uh, and yet and yet the image of these guys in their tuxedos with the ties loosened on stage looking so handsome and act, acting so silly and uh, in such a stylish way, uh, people, uh, men and women are very willing to overlook the silliness, uh, the offensiveness of the a lot of the material, overlook that and really just look at the style in, instead. And so this is why the myth of the Rat Pack endures. Yeah. Yeah. When you talked about some of the, the jokes at Sammy Davis Jr.'s expense, I mean, I felt that kind of punch in the gut. I felt bad for the guy. Yeah. It, 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 uh, you know, it, 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 it's very, I, one of the very many people I interviewed for the second volume of my Sinatra biography was the great Quincy Jones, the African American, um, musician and arranger, a brilliant, brilliant man. And he was, uh, he arranged a great Count Basie album, a Count Basie Sinatra album, and he he conducted and arranged uh, Sinatra's uh, famous shows at the Sands a few years after the Rat Pack shows in 1965, 1966. And Sinatra used to stand up on the stage in the showroom of the Sands, uh, the Copa Room, and he would make these silly uh, uh, racial jokes. I asked Quincy Jones, oh, what did you think? When you're there on the podium conducting the the great Count Basie band, and there's Sinatra making these uh, Amos and Andy jokes, uh, what do you think? And and Quincy Jones said, oh, I didn't like it very much. And why should he have? And and they don't sound very good today. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I, I don't like them very much either. But back then, back then, it was a different time and a different place. And I'm not saying those jokes were right. But the audiences then thought they were just hilarious, and of course they were white audiences. Right. Um, and then that's the other kind of the other paradox about Sinatra, though, because even though he'd make these you know politically incorrect jokes at the expense of Sammy Davis Jr., he was a really good friend to him. To it, I mean, there was some they had some falling outs, but uh, you know he kind of stuck out his neck. A few, like that one time that he stood as a best man at Sammy Davis's wedding to the uh, white well, model. Well, Sinatra was was really he when when Sinatra was in his late teens uh, and just beginning to sing and before anybody had a clue who Frank Sinatra was he used to he used to go to West 52nd Street in Manhattan this was a block between 5th Avenue and 6th Avenue in Manhattan today it's all glass office towers back in those days it was all brownstones three three story buildings and in the basement of every building was a jazz club you could walk down this block and there were 50 jazz clubs and in the basement of every one of these buildings there was a great jazz club and these geniuses you could you could see count basie you could see duke ellington you could listen to billy holiday ella fitzgerald and sinatra stopped in every one of those jazz clubs and he idolize these he he knew great musicians great musicianship when he heard it he knew these these african american artists were geniuses and they carried themselves like royalty and that's how sinatra regarded them and he, he as a liberal democrat uh, from the beginning of his life uh and even though he switched to a more conservative political stance, Sinatra was always a passionate advocate of tolerance. And he walked the walk as much as he talked the talk. And even though he could, he had this disagreeable side to him. He had this paradox that he could make the silly racial jokes. Uh, he, uh, he, stood behind, he stood behind his feelings. Yeah. So uh, this is the Art of Manliness podcast. We've got to ask this. Um, why is Sinatra still such a potent icon of American masculinity, even today? I um, mean, what was it, what was it about him that, you know, like there's that famous quote, women wanted him and men wanted to be him. Yeah. What's going on there? Well, I think you have to look deep underneath, uh, everything. Uh, yes, we can look at the, we can look at the aura, the mystique, the style of the Rat Pack. I think, 
I think that will go on for a long time. Uh, young people love that. Young people love to think about it, drink the martinis, smoke the cigarettes, imagine how fun it would have been to, to be in the Rat Pack. But I think long after all that has faded, all that uh, mystique from the 60s has faded, what's going to endure is Sinatra's singing voice. This is a voice for the ages, for the centuries. I think that people will still be listening to Sinatra uh, centuries from now. And why will they be listening? Because Sinatra, unlike, uh, listen, there are a lot of great voices out there, a lot of great voices on record and, uh, and, and even today, uh, many wonderful voices. But Sinatra had and still has in recording this absolutely unique ability to make you feel that he was feeling these feelings as in the instant that he was singing these songs. Nobody else can really do that. And it is, uh, it is an intensely, a definitively masculine voice. And it is a voice that is filled with, and this is, this is the key to the whole thing, a completely acceptable, Frank made it acceptable, vulnerability. Frank created uh, acceptability uh, for, uh, for vulnerability uh, in a man. He was a guy who could sing a torch song and really sell it because you thought he was feeling it. He was really feeling it while he was singing it. And so it's not just macho. It's not just swagger. Frank had plenty of that, and he can swagger with the best of them. But it's this vulnerability and, uh, again, this, uh, this genius at conveying the feelings of these great songs that he sang that, uh, that make men feel that it's okay to be vulnerable and make women feel this is a superbly masculine man, but this is a man who's not afraid of his feelings. And that, to women, of course, is a very, very sexy combination. Well, James Kaplan, this has been a great conversation. Uh, before we go, where can people find out more about uh, your books? On my wonderful website, <laughs> jameskaplan.net. Uh, they can read everything about my two Sinatra biographies, my other books as well. Uh, of course, both books are on Amazon. And, uh, and, and I really want to thank you, Brett. It, it is, it's very seldom that I get to speak for so long about this uh, great artist and about this music that I love. And it's clear you have a lot of the same feelings for him. And, and uh, so it's terrific to talk with you. Well, thank you so much, James. Thank you, Brett. My guest is James Kaplan. He is the author of the book Sinatra, the Chairman, and that's available on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. Really great read. You can find out more information about his work at jameskaplan.com. And like I said at the beginning of the show, if you want the show notes for this podcast, if you go to aom.is slash Sinatra, you'll find highlights, links to people, stories we mentioned, as well as a suggested Frank Sinatra playlist from James himself.